you know I'm loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it. And if you're loving it, you can't get enough of it. Put a hand high, right where the other is. Sit a week, but can't find that quitter with me. It's that bit of sweet literature, that little streets. Walk with the Prince of Peace, see what these footprints look Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and this is Pimping Ain't Easy Cardiology Edition. So if you've ever been a medical student, you know that during rounds you get pimped a lot and can be pretty brutal. This will be a pretty easy going uh, pimping session um, about cardiology topics. We'll go over several questions and we'll see how you do. Alright, let's go to question number one. So question number one is, what medications are indicated for a patient with an acute ST elevation MI? So we know we have to do the, a cardiac catheterization on these patients. But what medications should be, they be on post-catheterization? So take a couple seconds, think it through, and then try to answer for yourself. And then we'll go over it together. Pause here for some more time. Otherwise, let's get started with the answer. So first off, you always want to consider beta blockers. The reason why is we like to slow the heart rate down. Because if you can think of it, if the heart rate is beating very fast due to pain and trying to get an increase in cardiac output, it's requiring more oxygen. And because there's a blockage, as evidenced by the ST elevation, the heart will need to have an increased oxygen demand that's not meeting, increasing or worsening the cell death that's occurring in the heart wall due to hypoxia. So we try to keep the blood pressure down. Studies have been shown that there is no real goal heart rate you're set to. Really, just try to get it down to around heart rate of 60, basically as low as possible as the patient can tolerate. Second, the patient should have an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker on board, generally for patients with an ejection fraction less than 45%. So make sure the patient had a ventriculogram during the cardiac cath or get an echo post-catheterization to assess their ejection fraction. And if their EF is less than 45%, then they need to have an ACE inhibitor or ARB on board. Next that you need to start is a statin. So yeah, uh, high lipid levels, LDL, can contribute to developing heart attacks, but also it's their anti-inflammatory properties, which is why we use them in the acute situation. So Lipitor, Crestor, whatever medication that you prefer, um, start that as well. Again, remember that with an ST elevation MI, their LDL goal is now less than 100, with the ideal goal of being 70. In patients with NSTEMIs or STEMIs, if they're on their way to getting the cardiac catheterization, generally we have them on a heparin drip. Um, sometimes they're given Lovenox, just an antiplatelet agent. Usually we don't continue this post-cardiac catheterization. Just something to think about if there's a delay um, to the cardiac cath. And finally, Plavix or Prasidril. So these are antiplatelet agents that we use. Um, and depending if the patient has received a bare metal stent versus a drug-eluting stent, you'll have to change the duration of therapy for these medications. So these are the basic medications we start uh, in a patient with an acute ST elevation MI uh, pre and post uh, cardiac catheterization. All right, now let's move on to question two. What medications have been shown to improve survival and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Pause here for some more time. Otherwise, we'll go over the answer together. All right, so this is a extremely vital question that you'll be pimped on. It's a very important question. Um, the answer is number one, beta blockers. So beta blockers have been shown to improve survival in heart failure patients. If a patient's on a beta blocker and they come in with acute decompensation, we do not stop that beta blocker. And at the same time, if they're not on a beta blocker and they have acute decompensation, we do not start the beta blocker. We get them back up to a compensated heart failure and then start the beta blocker. Also, ACE inhibitors uh, slash uh, angiotensin receptor blockers are very important. Spironolactone has also been shown to improve survival. And then hydralazine with some type of nitrate um, has been shown to improve survival in African American patients. Remember that digitalis does not improve survival a lot of times. In small hospitals, they throw this on. It is not something that we generally use. Diuretics, again, do not improve survival, but they do improve symptoms, so they're important to give. So things like Lasix are important to give in a decompensated patient, but again, remember, it does not improve survival. So these are the basic medications that do improve survival with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. A vital question to know for any shelf or boards. All right, let's go on to question number three. So question number three, name four contraindications to selective beta blockers like metoprolol. Pause here for some more time, otherwise we'll go on to the answer. So 
the contraindications to Batopril are, number one, bradycardia. Obviously, a lot of times you're trying to bring the heart rate down. You want to avoid bringing it down too far. So if the patient's symptomatic, it's something to avoid. With that, hypotension. So metoprolol can not only decrease heart rate, but also decrease blood pressure as well. Um, so if they're becoming hypotensive, that would be a contraindication to giving the beta blocker. Next is reversible airway disease. So you know, realize beta blockers, so we're blocking a beta receptor. In the airways, the beta blockers actually lead to bronchodilation, meaning it opens up the airways. So blocking these receptors will cause a constriction. So in COPD patients, asthmatics, this is something to be concerned about. It doesn't mean you, it's an absolute contraindication. It just means that be wary of it. If you do start a beta blocker, look out for this complication. And finally, cocaine-induced cardiac ischemia. So you may have heard this, but in patients with who have taken cocaine and then come in with chest pain and the EKG is indicative of some type of ischemia present, the general thought is we do not give beta blockers. The reason why is that cocaine has a beta blocking property over alpha property itself. And if you give beta blockers, you really beta block them down with no alpha blockade as well. So the thought was you could give something like labetalol, which may have an alpha blockade and a beta blockade. But studies have shown this doesn't necessarily improve survival. So we generally don't give specific beta blockers like metoprolol in cocaine-induced cardiac ischemia. And those are some of the main contraindications. So let's go to question four. What medications are contraindicating patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Pause right here for some more time. Otherwise, we'll go on and talk about the answer. So number one, NSAID. So things like ibuprofen just can't give. It can lead to renal failure, leading to volume overload. Two, this gigantic word, essentially your glitazones. So examples include rosaglitazone, otherwise known as Avandia, pioglitazone, otherwise known as Actos, and troglitazone, otherwise known as Rezulin. So these things are definitely things to avoid because they actually induce heart failure and worsen heart failure. Next, let's go on to question number five. In question number five, you have a patient who presents with substernal chest pain that worsens when he lays back. EKG shows diffuse ST elevation throughout the EKG without reciprocal ST depression, as well as PR depression is noted. What is the likely diagnosis? Then pause here to think about it, but the answer here is acute pericarditis. In acute pericarditis, um, you will see ST elevations without reciprocal ST depressions, which is important to note because you want to make sure the patient's not having ST elevation MI. Now let's go on to question number six. In question number six, we have, what is the treatment of idiopathic pericarditis? Pause here if you want some more time, otherwise we'll go on to the answer. So first line treatment for pericarditis is NSAIDs. So giving them ibuprofen, naproxen, these are things that would treat the pericarditis. If a patient can't take NSAIDs for some reason, then your second line is colchicine. Avoid the use of prednisone because prednisone, when used in pericarditis, has been shown to increase the number of recurrences of pericarditis and the patient's future. So let's go into question number seven. A patient presents with a fixed splitting of S2 on the exam. What is the likely diagnosis? Pause here for some more time, otherwise we'll go over the answer together. So the answer is atrial septal defect. So this is almost pathognomonic. Anytime you see this on an exam or you see this on a board, it's atrial septal defect. Let's go to question number eight. How is the decision made to start patients with atrial fibrillation on warfarin, otherwise known as Coumadin? Pause here if you want to think about it, otherwise we'll go on to the answer. So the way we stratify patients who have AFib, whether they should be on aspirin or Coumadin, is something what we call the CHAD2 score. The CHAD2 score is a mnemonic um, that represents uh, certain conditions that increase the risk of stroke. So the CHAD2 score represents number one. The C stands for congestive heart failure, which the patient gets one point for having. Number two, the H stands for hypertension, which the patient gets another point for having. The A stands for age being greater than 65, which accounts for one point as well. D stands for diabetes, which is another one point. And then finally, S. S stands for stroke. And actually, in this case, S gives you two points. You add up the total number that they get, and you base their treatment based on their score. So aspirin applies to patients 0 to 1. Aspirin or Coumadin applies to patients who have at least 
a 2, and if they're greater than 2, they need to be on Coumadin. Really, also, clinical judgment should factor in here. So if you're having frequent falls, maybe Coumadin should not be your choice. All right, on to question number 9. What are the criteria for diagnosing rheumatic heart disease? This is a tough one. So pause here if you need some more time. Otherwise, we'll go on to the answer. So, number one, you need to have evidence of an alpha strep infection with two major or one major and two minor criteria. The major criteria include polyarthritis, erythema marginatum. So, erythema marginatum is a rash you get over the body. As demonstrated here, you can see that the margins of the rash are more red than the actual inner part of the rash. Carditis, chorea, and subcutaneous nodules. Minor criteria include fever, arthralgias, history of rheumatic heart disease, elevated acute phase reactants like CRP and ESR, and a prolonged PR interval. The reason we care about rheumatic heart disease is a lot of times if untreated leads to mitral valve stenosis. Question number 10. A patient presents with substernal chest pain that radiates to his back. He is hypotensive and tachycardic. His chest x-ray shows mediastinal widening. What is the likely diagnosis? Pause here if you need more time, otherwise we'll go on to the answer. So the answer is acute aortic dissection. And this is a medical emergency, so this needs to be identified right away. So mediastinal widening um, in this setting is almost characteristic for aortic dissection. So that's the pimping session. Hope it wasn't brutal. If you like this video, give it a like. Make sure to share this video on uh, Facebook as well as Twitter. You can follow us on Twitter at iMedSchool. If any comments about the video, any suggestions for any future videos, make sure to place them down below. And lastly and most importantly, subscribe. Note that we started a podcast on iTunes, and just an audio podcast that's completely separate from this one. Uh, just search iMedical School and it should pop right up. Our last episode was Myeloproliferative Disorders. This is Dr. K from iMedical School and I'll see you next time.